are you wearing? KD. Oh, we're gonna be in so much trouble. Honestly. What, 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 it's why? hot out. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, we're gonna be in for it. Hmm. I mean... And what do I suppose you're up to? About five foot nine inches, Sergeant. Shut up! Do you think that I was referring to your height? Ross? No, no. S sorry, Sergeant. No. What are you doing here? Field firing, Sergeant. Field firing, Sergeant. Shut up! Now, I don't suppose you've had a look around. But you appear to be somewhat of an individual today. Uh, well, that's right, my lovely boy. You are out of dress. Now, I don't suppose that you have an explanation for this, do you? Uh, well, it, it's KD. It's hot out today. Too hot, you say? Well, why don't you go and write your mummy a letter? Hmm? Tell her how hot things are here. So hot, in fact, that you decided to wear something different than the rest of the squad. Well, let me tell you what you should write in that letter. That it ain't half hot, Mum! Now, double away get changed into the correct order of dress, and report to the cookhouse. Join Lottie Da Gunner Graham and Private Mackenzie. Potatoes are waiting. <laughs> yes, Sergeant. Yeah, right away, Sergeant. As mentioned in videos previously in the series, musketry of the Second World War had evolved far beyond the use of simply just the rifle. Basic infantry weapons now included the rifle, the light machine gun or Bren, the grenade, the submachine carbine, the two-inch mortar, and the anti-tank rifle, later the Piet. This forced training time to be spread over a greater number of subjects. In some cases, certain subjects were reduced. Take the rifle qualification of just 45 rounds by mid-war. Others were simply as comprehensive as they needed to be. One constant when comparing musketry training from the Great War and the Second World War was the emphasis on what was termed field firing. This placed individuals and groups in live-fire tactical situations outside of the nicely laid out construct of the classification range and into a field setting. Field firing leading into the Great War had been divided into three groups of practices, the individual, the fire direction, and the collective field practices. Now, these have been dealt with comprehensively in the Musketry of 1914 series here on the channel. Field firing in the Second World War was seemingly as comprehensive if not specifically laid out, as it had been in 1914. It is very clear, however, just how much importance was placed on it. Information regarding field firing was contained in the manual entitled Weapon Training, which contained general information about the more generic aspects of training with infantry small arms and ranges. Like many pamphlets in the small arms training series, it was republished in 1942. The first mention of field firing in the manual states this. Exercises with ball ammunition on the field firing range are the culmination of weapon training. The field firing range provides conditions most nearly akin to war, and all shooting on other ranges will be regarded merely as means to obtain efficiency in this final test. The capabilities of companies may here be judged far better than by the results obtained on classification practices or in competitions where conditions are mainly artificial. 
there was specific direction to include some preliminary live fire exercises involving range estimation, fire control, and the adjustment of fire. These were to take place before any tactical scheme was undertaken. Field firing could be developed to a level that was quite complex, involving not just infantry small arms, but infantry support arms as well, such as 3-inch mortars and Vickers machine guns. Indeed, even combined arms exercises were prescribed, these including artillery and armour. Here, from the War Diary of the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada, details of a field firing exercise are given. Note that after a morning air raid, the exercise commenced at the platoon level, using the support of a 3-inch mortar and two machine guns from the Cameron Highlanders of Ottawa, who were the Divisional Machine Gun Battalion. Come the afternoon, the next company was rotated in for their turn on the range. An interesting addition to the mid-war 1942 manual were details of the use of live ammunition for battle indoctrination. Here, in given schemes, rounds would be fired over the heads of friendly troops, simulating the effect of incoming fire and making the men accustomed to the sound of bullets passing overhead. Now, without specific details in the manuals, some degree of imagination must be used to replicate practices that may have taken place. Apart from the aforementioned fire direction and fire control exercises, we must assume that any field firing program would have included individual practices, progressing to section level practices, platoon, and so on presumably as well, schemes of attack and defense would also be included. It was within the context of these schemes that the practices for this video were developed and executed. The targetry used for these evolutions, as well as in this video, were historical figure targets. Now there's more information that can be found about these targets in a video entitled Preliminary Training, found in the playlist entitled Musketry of the Second World War. The numbered figure targets, as explained there and shown here, were used predominantly in these field firing evolutions. More often than not, they were made out of simple deal or thin wood. They could be rigged to appear and disappear with a simple arrangement made of cord and wood. And the use of falling plates, simple steel plates placed to be knocked over by the shooter, could also be used. I've used a simple combination of both of these type of targets. The high quality steel figure targets as recently received by the channel, as well as wooden and cardboard facsimiles. The appropriate targets could also be rigged to move. Sadly, here for these practices I had neither the time nor the facilities to use such targets. I did however make use of the appearing and disappearing framework. There wasn't official scoring per se as laid out in the manuals, but the number of hits would certainly be counted to gauge overall effectiveness. Ammunition used for this video was of two types. I used a mixture of my regular cast loads, as well as a small amount of commercial s &B. Of course all of it was placed in chargers and carried in a bandolier. The first example we'll examine is a defensive scheme involving fighting from a fixed position. Additionally, there's been the provision for a withdrawal and a counterattack evolution as part of the exercise. Defensive fighting was of paramount importance in the early war years. Both in France and later, during the tense years immediately after, much effort was placed on the defensive. Trenches and positions were typically well developed, section-sized emplacements with revetments, shelters, and rudimentary communication trenches. While not anything close to Great War standards, they were nevertheless well established. Later in the war, greater emphasis was placed on smaller positions. The operations of withdrawal and counterattack were two evolutions that, while obviously not desirable, were nevertheless critical. As a point of interest, it would seem that, especially earlier in the war, personal camouflage was something that was focused on in training. This seems to have fallen slightly by the wayside as high-tempo operations began later in the war. Here, an outline of a possible defensively oriented field firing evolution done at the individual level. From a scrape or shallow trench, which admittedly here is not quite of the prescribed styles found in the manual, but nevertheless serves as a less laborious alternative, 
the soldier will engage a series of targets at unknown ranges in a sequence from far to near. This will simulate the advance of a body of enemy towards his position. When the enemy gets too close, a withdrawal will be ordered to an area which will serve to mount a counterattack from. This will be done as immediately as possible and will retake the position. Here we can see the soldier's fighting position, a shallow scrape in the ground. Looking out to the front of a defensive position, the ground was always christened. That is to say, prominent features were given specific names. These were important, as every man in the platoon would be familiar with them, and the position of the enemy would be indicated in reference to these. Here, three main linear features, the road immediately to the front, the middle ridge, and the far ridge. These were augmented by a point known as the gap. For more information about indication of targets and fire control orders, the aforementioned Part 2 of the Musketry of the Second World War series deals with this in detail. As mentioned, the targets were set up in three main groupings, the closest of which was near the road on the left flank. For this engagement, I selected three number five targets. These simulate the exposed head of an enemy over cover. The intent of field firing targets was to simulate an enemy, and therefore were painted or colored in an appropriate fashion. Here we see the customary two-tone effect used with military targets of the era. Moving up the slope at about 100 yards distance on the middle ridge, a series of intermediate sized number 4A and number 3 targets was set up. These were of two types. One was a steel knockdown version. The other three were simple wooden targets mounted on an appearing and disappearing frame. Further on up the hill, at about 150 yards distance, there was a small section of three number two figure targets. These would be the first to be engaged, and represented the enemy cresting the ridge and moving down the forward slope. These were also a combination of target types, two wood and one steel. In the perfect world, the defensive position would be prepared out of contact, that is to say, without any threat of enemy action. For that purpose, the most important tool the infantryman had apart from his personal weapon was his shovel. Now, admittedly, as mentioned, I didn't do a lot of digging and merely scraped the turf and some of the surface soil away to represent what would be a shallow slit trench or what might be known as a shell scrape. I hope you, the viewers of the channel, will excuse my lack of digging and see my rudimentary efforts as a representation rather than a complete evolution. So a defensive field firing scheme could easily have included the digging of a prepared position. Following that, ammunition would have been issued. Now in reality, facing the enemy, ammunition of course would have been issued well beforehand. But in a range setting, that is to say with carefully controlled safety aspects and any preliminary administration such as digging of trenches would have probably happened before the platoon was brought together, briefed, and given its ammunition. Another aspect, conspicuous especially in the early part of the war, was a comprehensive preparation for battle. This included the application of camouflage. Waiting in a safe area behind the range, where the position was ready to be occupied, the rifle could be then loaded and safety catch applied. As we watch here, it serves to remind the viewer of how fiddly the bandoliers were. Perhaps surprising, the bandolier was the primary way of carrying rifle ammunition. Once the individuals were ready to begin the range practice, last minute arrangements would have been confirmed, range staff would have taken their places, safety flags would have been flown, and the participants would wait for the order to begin the practice. Stand to! Now remember, this is demonstrating a defensive scheme. Part of defensive fighting is the possibility of engaging in close quarters, and for that, the bayonet would have been fixed. As noted in previous videos on the formal range practices conducted during the war, an aspect of fighting from a trench was known as the position of readiness, whereby the rifle was drawn back from the parapet and the man hid as best as he could until the target presented itself. Due to the shape of the ground, this was exceptionally difficult, and thus the rifle was laid on the parapet. 200! Get up! 
We're down six o'clock. Enemy section. Fire. With the orders given, the sights were set and the engagement could begin. Same spot, slightly left. Road, quarter left. Enemy, rapid fire. Now, despite the fact that I had set everything up myself, once I lay on the ground, I couldn't see the third target because of a piece of brush in the way. It took a bit, but I found it. As already noted, the bandolier isn't exactly the acme of ammunition accessibility. Despite the successful close-range engagement, with the notional enemy pressing upon the position, the order to withdraw is given. Here to withdraw! Move! While not perhaps an integral part of all defensive field firing, I decided to include a withdrawal aspect into this exercise simply to illustrate the wide and varied drills and techniques that could have been practiced. In reality, it would have been the imagination of those in command that was the limiting factor to this type of training. After safely withdrawing off the position, presumably due to its compromise by overwhelming enemy pressure, a position was gained in which to organize and launch a counterattack. Counterattack from this position! Well, obviously done in this case in a very small scale. In reality, this would typically be conducted by a depth section or a reserve platoon. Again, its inclusion in this exercise is to illustrate and practice the essentials of the evolution. Advance! On command, the counterattack is launched, perhaps preceded by a short bombardment by a mortar or two, or perhaps covered by machine guns of another platoon or company, the counterattack would move until contact with the enemy was resumed, an engagement and assault could result. Here, the training evolution called for a hasty engagement, followed by the assault with the bayonet, combined with post-quarter shooting techniques as practiced in the early war period, firing from the hip as the assault goes in. More information on this can be found in the video on that subject elsewhere on the channel. With the enemy cleared from the position, it would be reoccupied, ready to stave off yet another attack. Building on the somewhat static nature of a defensive-oriented field firing exercise, Perhaps the first exposure to a more dynamic shooting environment would be a walkthrough of a series of targets at an individual level. Perhaps this could have been augmented with the use of the hand grenade as other, more complex evolutions were introduced into the men's training. Again, the skills of the assault including the bomb, bayonet and close quarter shooting could all be practiced at the individual level before incorporating them into section and platoon schemes. Here, a simple lane-type range is set up with a number of wooden targets. Here, the man is presented with a target at 100 yards. After the initial contact, he moves to a notional Bren gun position to drop off his magazines. Once complete, he can thus begin his advance. On the way, he is confronted with a number of close-range targets with which he must deal before moving on. Once these are cleared, he again engages the initial target and moves to assault. This time he will throw a grenade first before closing with the enemy position and clearing it with bullet and bayonet. Once appropriate briefings and even dry walkthroughs to encourage safety and awareness, ammunition would be issued and the practice could commence. The target appears and is engaged.
Although there was no actual Bren gun here, or even need there have been one in reality, the step of ammunition management was important. Every man in the section carried Bren gun magazines, and these needed to be with the gun, not the individual. Now this practice is not necessarily being done at top speed. Especially at a basic level, field firing would have been a case for small, manageable steps as training progressed. Building on a slower walkthrough model, the intensity and speed could be improved incrementally. Here, now that action's been engaged at close quarters, the decision to fix the bayonet was made. Now this is somewhat fabricated, as anything below 300 yards required the bayonet to be fixed for correct shooting. Part of this training would be to ensure the man was aware of the state of his magazine. Time taken at appropriate moments was important to ensure the magazine was well topped up. That way, the maximum number of rounds would always be available for any unforeseen sticky situation. Having engaged the primary target a second time, cover is taken from which to observe the general area. Satisfied that it's within bombing range, a grenade is used. The number 36 grenade, or Mills bomb, was a very common standard grenade used by the British and Commonwealth forces during the Second World War. It was lethal, especially in confined spaces, and its fragmentary effect would do grievous harm if it landed within the confines of an enemy's trench or other position. Here we see the use of the late war close quarter shooting technique. This is the earliest official documentation of the use of the middle finger to operate the trigger we're all clear. and is covered in depth in a video on the channel. So this is by no means the definitive answer to what an individual close quarter field firing exercise would have looked like. But hopefully there were enough possible elements here to give one an understanding. In this next example of a field firing exercise, the idea is to send the individual through a course of fire that gradually introduces him to concepts that are found within the section and platoon. The idea in this scheme is to practice his personal skills under the auspices of operating as part of a section or platoon. Attacks made by both of these groupings were commonly flanking operations, with the liberal use of covering fire from the Bren or the two-inch mortar. In order to introduce the man to the use of his weapons in this context, while still operating at an individual level on the range, he is supported by a Bren gun. Um, a nominal Bren gun. Sorry. The use of ground, selecting lines of advance, and operating with the understanding that there's fire being directed at the enemy whilst this is all happening were all things that were integral to maneuver on the battlefield and fighting the infantry fight. Covered by the Bren gun, the assault can be made. After approaching to within bombing distance, the grenade could be thrown and the enemy closed with. So with those tenants observed, here's the layout of the range. The soldier breaks the wood line and comes under immediate contact from two relatively close targets. He engages them and then moves quickly for a local assault. Once there, he comes under further contact from targets in depth, which he engages as well. This allows for the nominal Bren gun to come into action and begin giving covering fire. Once this is established, the flanking maneuver can begin. From a position on the left, a grenade is thrown and an assault made. For this practice, the full gamut of personal equipment is worn, including the anti-gas equipment and the shovel. While all were perhaps not included on field firing ranges, I chose to do so for this practice so that I might be able to pass comment on this very common occurrence. Especially in Northwest Europe, nearly all of the men went into action so encumbered, although anti-gas equipment soon became relegated to transport as the threat diminished. 
I decided to carry the shovel using a method that had it shoved through the brace of the webbing so that the handle projected to the rear. It was such a common way to carry it, yet outwardly appeared to be the most awkward. As alluded to before in other exercises, there would have been a specific point where the man loaded his rifle. As we can see here, the approach to the range area was made in dead ground. Part of the exercise was for the man to assess his surroundings and act accordingly. Given the large amount of open ground to cover and the possibility of close contact, the bayonet was fixed. As alluded to in the video on the 1942 rifle course, this was in fact a matter of course. The rifle was zeroed up to 300 yards with the bayonet fixed. Immediately upon breaking the wood line, first contact is made. Move up and attack from close quarter. With the initial engagement done, the distance is closed to enable a close assault. Subsequent close quarters engagement is made from a modified kneeling position behind a stump. And the position is rushed at the point of the bayonet. Just as this position is dealt with, contact is made from a subsequent enemy position. Take cover! Now it doesn't look like it from this angle, but in fact the ground was a little bit depressed just in front of where I was. This necessitated crawling up to a fire position to gain advantage over the enemy. It looks awkward, and it perhaps was. The blade of the shovel was consistently digging into the ground, acting like some sort of weird anchor as I moved up the slope. 150! Slightly left! Enemy in clearing! Fire! It did, however, remain in position. This was the initial engagement of the distant targets that enabled the nominal Bren gun to come into action. We will assault from that position! Left flanking! Move on the Bren covering fire! With the considerable fire put down by the Bren group, the flanking maneuver could thus commence. The use of ground was an absolutely important aspect of infantry training. Here, the shape of the slope is used to hide the movement off to the flank. And with the enemy identified in position, a short stretch of road was used to close the distance. Wait here, prepare to assault. The idea here was to maneuver to a point so that the covering fire of the Bren gun was at right angles to one's approach to the enemy. This being in a somewhat safe position, the magazine was topped up, ready for the next part of the evolution. As this was to be an exercise which featured the use of a grenade, it too was checked to make sure that all was in order.
After everything was ready, the command to advance could be given, and the enemy closed upon. Engage when you see them! Advance! A quick movement was made, still under the covering fire of the Bren gun, to a position from which to throw the Mills bomb. It was important to close this final distance to the enemy quickly, while any effects from the hand grenade that were not lethal were still effective. As we can see here, it's not always the most graceful of movements, so clear. especially when the terrain is so broken. Now it was common practice not to simply stay in the position of the enemy, but to move forward through the position and gain a further point at which to observe the direction of the advance. Now, for obvious reasons, I cannot include examples of larger groupings such as sections or platoons in this video. Suffice it to say, these types of exercise shown here would have been initial forays into the area of field firing, confirming individual skills which could then be applied to larger practices. Attacks made by sections and platoons, perhaps supported by the aforementioned platoon and battalion weapons, would have been relatively common, while larger undertakings at company and battalion level would have been much less so, due to the large area needed and the resultant safety considerations. Regardless, live fire training, such as field firing, remained of crucial importance. One can only imagine how the various training schemes were developed as those units earmarked for the invasion of Normandy spent that considerable workup time fine-tuning their skills. Recruits and replacements sent out from depots to units in the field would probably not have had the luxury of exhaustive exposure to training such as this, as the immediacy of the needs of the field units in action in North Africa, Italy, or the Far East negated the luxury of time. It wasn't the be-all and end-all, however. With particular note of the units whose first action was at Normandy in Northwest Europe, there remained a very steep learning process as they adapted their training to real-world situations, fighting their way closer and closer to Germany. These field firing exercises would regardless serve as the pinnacle of a given unit's training, being invaluable in building that unit's efficiency in the field. Faraway theatres such as Burma and other areas of the Far East would bring special challenges and different ways of fighting. Thoughtfully developed live fire training was to be found there and in many other theaters around the world. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page. The perils of throwing Mills bombs in the woods. This time, managed to get it pretty close. The safety lever on the other hand, that's another matter.